hello there. Summer's summer's over. That it is. <laughs> Greg, I hope you had a good summer. You too. I'm, I'm Dave Forger. This is Greg Christopher, and uh, we're we're back with Ask the ID. In fact, as we get started, let's talk about the summer for an athletic director. One would think that your schedule would uh, be a little less hectic than during the school year, is it, or is that uh, not even close it, to the truth? It is, it isn't. It's funny how many people think I don't even work. Uh, None uh, of us work in the summer. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, from, from the end of school, mid-May until the end of June, uh, mm -hmm. things are really hectic with travel because you've got conference meetings, NCAA meetings, mm -hmm. and then you also try to fit in some donor travel that you weren't able to get in during sure. the spring, during basketball season, and so forth. The month of July, except for basketball coaches and some of our other Olympic sports that are summer sports, the month of July is when you try to sneak vacation in. That's the reality. Uh, then you come back uh, you know, sometime mid to late July and, and try to catch up and get ready for, uh, for football season. Let's talk about football. Yeah. I, I think we all knew that the 2009 year was going to be pretty good because we just went. And then we have a couple of years where it might be a bit lean due to any number of circumstances. This season should be considerably better? Absolutely. I, you know, and Dave's talked about this a lot. I think you're seeing it in the media reports out there. there there's mm -hmm. a real positive vibe about this program, and we've been watching it and tracking it. You, you know, our fans have watched a program get rebuilt. Uh, that's essentially what's happened. And you've seen it in the numbers. You've seen the, the kids just tracking through the program, mm -hmm. uh, re building, stockpiling, whatever you phrase you want to use, but getting the numbers back, the talents there. I don't know what that translates into wins and losses, but uh, here's what I expect this year. We are going to turn the corner. We're going to have a winning record. We'll be back in the bowl game or bowl game contention in our league, and we're going to compete for the Mac East Championship. Uh, uh, you know, again, you can say that when you watch this team and you watch these coaches day in, day out in the hallways and, and how they act and, and how they react. Football programs in a really good spot right now. And this rebuilding has all been done the right way. I think so. You know, and uh, you know, again, it's fun to watch the kids. It's fun to interact with them. It's a good group. Uh, you know, I think the first half of our season is pretty tough with the two uh, the two BCS games and uh, Toledo sandwiched in there right at the beginning. But uh, if things track the right way, I, I think we could be playing for a championship uh, the last half of November, and that's what you want for sure. Let's talk about scheduling. You mentioned. Mm -hmm. that tough to the beginning of the, uh, the season for this team. And a person is asked about Rutgers and Army and uh, scheduling those kind of games on the road for alumni in mm -hmm. those areas. Talk, if you would, about how one does go about scheduling road games. And I'm assuming there's a strategy involved if it's not a big money game. Right. The, it, it, I guess, Dave, the, the way I would put it, our perfect schedule, uh, we've got four games that we need to schedule, and then the eight conference games. And every once in a while, you'll hear a conversation about nine conference games. So if that were to ever happen in the future, you know, that could change everything. But our basic philosophy, if we can get the perfect schedule, is uh, a guarantee game on either end. Uh, and, and I'm using this as a, I guess, a figurative uh, you know, uh, scale here. But uh, meaning we go play a money game to help our budget, and then we have a one double A come play us. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you'd also have two non-BCS home and homes. Uh, so, uh, you know, a schedule, you know, those would be the games like Idaho, like Wyoming. Uh, you know, we're talking with Old Dominion right now, which is now going to be in Conference USA, the series with Western Kentucky, some of those types of games. Mm -hmm. You don't always get that perfect schedule. Uh, you know, this year we've got the two BCS games. You've got Virginia Tech and Florida, maybe a little heavier than we would normally yeah. like, but uh, Virginia Tech is a, is a contract that's that been on our books and pushed and moved around for more than a decade. And really? finally, we're going to have to play it uh, one <laughs> okay. way or another. Uh, but, um, you know, that's that's the perfect scenario. Uh, I agree. I mean, philosophically, we do try to get out east whenever we can uh, because if you look at where our pockets of alums are, short of the Midwest and Ohio, it, it's that east coast. So whether it's the Boston College game, Temple was great when, uh, when they were in the league. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we were out there, uh, we've tried to get Army repeatedly. They won't play us. Uh, we've tried to get Rutgers. We were close one time and, and just couldn't get it done. We've got the series with Maryland coming up, uh, and then uh, and then like I mentioned, Old Dominion. So we are trying to be conscious about playing games in that East Coast area. 
the other area is Florida. We've tried to be down there a couple of times. Yeah. The FIU game, Florida. Uh, we've tried to get Florida Atlantic, but uh, again, just, just not successful. Uh, would love to get into Texas as well. And again, just haven't been able to get a game, uh, get somebody that's interested in playing us uh, uh, when it fits them and fits us at the same time. So Army would not play Bowling Green because? Well, I, I think the message we got was they already have a steady diet of MAC teams okay. they like to play. If you look at their recent history, I think they've got Eastern Michigan. They've played Kent State pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. um, they may have somebody else in there, too, but uh, um, it just hasn't been able to work out. You mentioned Temple. Mm -hmm. What's the latest scuttlebutt on replacing Temple in the Mid-American Conference? Who do you want? Is it my choice? No. <laughs> uh, we're at 13, and it's going to be 13 for a little okay. while. Uh, you know, does that mean a year, two years, five years? I don't know. You know, we've proven that we can make 13 work. Is it great? No, uh, it's not. But uh, we can make it work. Uh, this is all in John Steinbrecher's lap. You know, so it's it's his work to and he's working with the presidents and keeping the ads plugged in. But uh, I, I think if you talk to the room of presidents and ADs, uh, you'd probably get a majority, although not a complete consensus, mm -hmm. that they'd probably prefer 14 over 12. Uh, if, you're, yeah. if you're saying, all right, we're not gonna stay at 13, which way are we gonna go? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there are people that would like to be at 12, there are some that would like to be at 14, and, and you know, I don't know that anybody likes 13, but again, we've, we've proven we can make it work. Beautiful. Let's talk, we've talked about uniforms and logos and that kind of thing on occasion on this program. We've talked about, about everything. Right? Yeah, but so let's delve back into that. Are there going to be some subtle changes in, in, in colors and uniforms here? I, I think the, the, the one part of that question was uh, some somebody had heard that we had changed our orange or changed our brown. And, and the, uh, the story behind this is, is actually fascinating. And uh, okay. it goes back probably three years now. Some, I don't even know what the situation was. But somehow one day uh, I learned that this university had two shades of orange that it used and two shades of brown. Okay. There was an athletic orange and an academic orange, and then an athletic brown and an academic brown. Right. And I, I guess I had never ever heard that before, and I had never ever heard of a school that had academic colors and athletic colors. I've been here 30 years, and this is the first time here. <laughs> yeah. so and, so, um, no offense, but that just seems silly to me. So, it, it, it unfortunately sure. wasn't something I could just flip the light switch and change, uh, but we did get uh, the right people around the table and we eventually got it changed. And I honestly don't know which ones we picked at this point in time, but okay. at least now we have a consistent orange and a consistent brown, uh, or as consistent as you can probably be. Um, and uh, so that, that was the history of the orange and brown and, and trying to be a little more consistent university-wide Let's turn to a more serious note as mm -hmm. the Penn State the situation. Talk, if you would, about what happened there, how that was handled. And a lot of people are convinced that just the football culture there mm -hmm. made it easier for the Joe Paternos and the, and the other people in authoritative positions not to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that make sense? You know, you? I, until you're, you're sitting in their chairs and really uh, around the table for all the discussions. I don't know that it makes sense to, to wade into that type of a, a conversation right here, uh, especially because we don't, we frankly don't have a couple hours to really have this conversation. The, the big things would be, Dave, I mean, clearly the, on a human level, just an absolute tragedy, you know, what took place and, and how it played out. Um, it's also pretty clear as you read and you go through everything that people involved that could have done more and uh, you know when we are dealing with the health and welfare of our 425 student athletes uh, let alone 4,000 campers that come to our camps uh, it's something we talk about a fair amount of, of the very real uh, again health safety welfare that we are held accountable for for those student athletes for our staff and coaches and uh, it, you've got to take those things seriously what Bowling Green is going to be doing, uh, and, and it's not 
just an athletics situation, but uh, Dr. Maisie has talked about this. We're going to take the free report, uh, which if you've read it, uh, athletics is this much of it. There's a lot of it that's university-wide, and we are going to use the free report as essentially a, a case study, a learning example of, of what do we have in place at Bowling Green that's the right way, and then what are some things we need to perhaps shore up, uh, whether it's related to the Cleary Act or, or some other things. So uh, I don't think we're the only school that's going to be doing this. I'm, I'm willing to bet there's a lot of schools across the country uh, that, uh, that are going to be using the free report as a, as a learning tool to try to prevent something like that from ever happening on, on our campus. I think we've got it covered this time. Good, good to be back and yeah. see you again. Do this again. We'll be back, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, next month. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dave.